Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webcast. Honeycomb Learn is the series and episode one, Instrument Better for a Happy Debugging Team. My name is Jared Amahan. I'm here with Honeycomb sitting next to my colleague, Nathan LeClaire. Uh, we're going to get started in about two minutes. I want to give some folks time to join. Uh, so I'll be back to you in about a minute or two. Thank you. Okay, folks, uh, thanks again for joining today, taking uh, time out of your busy day. Uh, we'll run for half an hour to 40 minutes, depending on questions. I'm going to do some housekeeping before we dive into the details. Uh, so how, welcome to our webcast episode one, How to Instrument Code for a Happier Debugging Team. Before we dive in, uh, the housekeeping, if you have a question of any time during the webcast, Use the Ask a Question tab located below the player. Your question will be addressed during the Q&A at the end. And also at the end of the webinar, please take a moment to rate us and provide any feedback using the Rate This tab below the player. It's that for attachments, we will have um, give you access to Honeycomb Play, some of these slides for today's webcast, and some observability e-guides. Uh, if you do have technical difficulties, I won't be taking care of that, but somebody will. So go to the bottom of the page and click on support for viewers. And finally, the recorded session uh, will be available using the same URL shortly following the conclusion. Feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. So let's get started. Uh, Honeycomb Learn, we uh, have a series. It will run uh, monthly for the next Five, episode one today. Uh, Nathan LeClaire is uh, the speaker of the main event. Nathan. Hey there. And uh, I am your host today. My name is Jared Mann. I've been with Honeycomb three months. I'm actually pretty excited to join the Honeycomb team doing some really interesting stuff for developers and operations teams in the world. And so let's uh, introduce yourself, Nathan, and your background. I think that will be useful for the audience. Sure. So um, my name is Nathan LeClaire. I'm a sales engineer here at Honeycomb. So I help with everything from getting our customers enabled so they can actually purchase in the first place to then uh, making sure they're successful in the whole life cycle of using Honeycomb. Um, and I worked for three years at a company called Docker. So we created a lot of new uh, cool technologies and uh, trends in the world. And we also created some observability problems. So I'm here to uh, mop up some of that mess and uh, sort of pay my dues uh, by serving in the observability space uh, at Honeycomb. And if you can't tell from my accent, I hail from Dublin, Ireland. Nathan's from Kentucky. Go Wildcats. That's the, the basketball. Wildcats big, basketball. Yeah, big basketball fan. I'm actually a Warriors fan. And he just told me that Cousins came from the Wildcats. That's college. right. Yeah. Boogie is, in fact, a Wildcat. Very cool. So our topic for today, uh, what is instrumentation? And who is responsible for instrumenting code? Why should you do it? Um, is it hard? There is um, this belief that it, it's difficult to do, it's time consuming, it, uh, developers want to get on with uh, developing the features and less um, in terms of the housekeeping and the you know, helping for the future debugging team, and then how do you get started? So we're going to show you Honeycomb in action. Uh, Nathan's going to drive that. But before we get into that, we're going to go through some uh, best practices. So first of all, taking a step back, um, what makes DevOps teams unhappy? Uh, these are things that we've heard from the market and from our customers. 
often it feels like they have too many tools. And when an incident occurs or a major event or there's a performance um, challenge going on with your production system, uh, it's difficult to know exactly where to start. And there's a lot of questions. Uh, you're juggling a variety of tools, be it metrics monitoring, log management tools. And often you reach a dead end. And if you can't resolve the issue or the problem with your production system, often you go back to the engineering team and uh, you know, deliver code that's hopefully going to fix that um, for future. Uh, a lot of uh, teams are spending too much time on call. The more time spent fixing and maintaining, the less time is spent innovating. In fact, um, there's plenty of surveys out there in the world. A recent one that Stripe did claims that 42% of time is spent on the maintaining and fixing. And the impact to the business is pretty detrimental. So sometimes issues just aren't resolved fast enough. SLOs aren't being met. Uh, customer complaints are on the rise. So then the impact to the customer support team and, of course, revenue and the uh, reputation of your brand as there is damage. So observability is uh, there is a lot of different uh, vendors in the market claiming observability. Our definition of observability is that the production system is in a state where you can ask it any question. So better understand exactly what is going on with your production system right now um, at any point in time. And that means you know, everyday uh, issues that occur with production systems that are uh, distributed and microservices architected but also when something really bad goes wrong and there's a major incident or an outage. So we, uh, during this series, we will help you understand what is the path to observability. Uh, a lot of teams feel like, I'm not ready for this, or it's too challenging. Our goal with this series is to help guide you and walk you through a set of best practices and tools uh, to get you to a point of observability for your system. So today's uh, focus is all about instrumentation. Upcoming ones will focus on these other aspects, which is how to um, how to run queries, how to set up alerts, how to do um, incident response and introspect your code in real time through interactive visuals, and spotting outliers and anomalies compared to the baseline, and then ultimately um, learning as an entire DevOps team. So there's a continuous iteration and learning and improvement of those systems as you as you all um, become better, more familiar with what's going on in your production. So Nathan, uh, let's start with what is in instrumentation? I think it's always mm -hmm. important to clarify definitions. And uh, we chatted a few days ago in prep for this session. And it's sort of like oh, joining the dots on a picture. And I found this one because it's actually kind of hard to tell what that picture is although it's starting to be joined up. So tell us uh, what you, when you work with customers, what is instrumentation? Well, in uh, the Honeycomb model, what we ultimately want are structured events, um, which in the case of tracing are the same as spans. And so we need to understand sort of what's actually happening in your systems in production. We need to capture the real information of what's going on in your code and send that along to Honeycomb somehow. And so instrumentation just means adding ornamentation to your code that actually captures those details and then forwards them along to Honeycomb so you can actually sort of clearly sketch out what's really going on in production and, and um, justify your mental model of what you think is happening in the system with what's actually happening. So you're sort of like, the way I think about it is the developer, the team of developers are um, creating uh, information and content along with their code so other team members can visualize what they were thinking when they created the code in the first place. Yeah, so um, you, you uh, usually collaborate together to write instrumentation as a team. Mm -hmm. um, so very frequently, one person who's sort of very motivated will um, add the initial stuff uh, that kind of gets you 
things out of the box or maybe some, some low-hanging fruit. Um, and then people will add things of interest later on uh, that maybe are, are really relevant to them or you know, by dropping a couple lines of code in, you can sort of ornament other things um, with, with uh, additional information. So you do see that instrumentation is this iterative process where you start with a small core and then you just kind of work your way outwards and then the next thing you know you have just about any uh, answer that you might want out of the system uh, in the data that you have coming into Honeycomb. Yeah, okay. So I just noticed a, a question from the audience. The, the audio is not great. We will do our best to speak up. So um, we're, we're set up in a, in a dedicated room. We're actually sitting next to each other and we're on a speakerphone. So we will I usually don't have a problem projecting. So uh, tell me, Nathan, in terms of uh, this visual uh, model or uh, you know, depicting something that was thought of as the development team were creating this new feature, um, don't metrics and logs give you this? And I sort of think of it like, is it a, a sketch drawn by an eight-year-old that you roughly can figure out what that is? There's some squiggly lines. I think they're birds. Or is it something that's much more high resolution, like a Monet painting, where you can actually see really pixelated view of exactly what's going on? Is that a good analogy or metaphor to use? Yeah, so I think that's a really good way of thinking about things. Um, and especially metrics, they really present this very high level sketch of your system. And as you want to add more detail to metrics, you really, really rapidly hit storage space limitations and fundamentally just limitations of the data model metrics where in Honeycomb you can have a variety of fields and you'll see some examples uh, as we go through the demo of instrumentation. Um, you can have essentially infinite dimensionality and be tagging your events with anything that you want and that will be available for you to query later on. So I think of it as, as capturing this really crisp high resolution snapshot of what's actually happening in your systems in production. You're not working with these sort of second or third order pictures of things. I mean, so I think high resolution is a really great way to put it. Um, and especially metrics, they just have a kind of a high level sketch. Um, logs, on the other hand, generally tends to be really, really zoomed in. Um, so it'd be like storing individual pixels when you're actually interested in a nice, crisp, clear picture you can sort of zoom in and out of. and um, uh, yeah, high resolution is absolutely how I would uh, describe uh, the Honeycomb data model. So who on the team uh, should be focused on instrumenting? And you know, this is certainly something we hear a lot of with customers and, and new customers where it's like, oh, um, should it be the entire development team? Uh, how involved is the operations and SRE team in this effort? And how does somebody get started on doing better instrumentation? Yeah, so um, we, we uh, generally, like I kind of alluded to before, think of instrumentation as something that maybe one brave soul kind of takes up at first and sort of does the initial work. Just reading up the boilerplate, things like initializing the Honeycomb clients and uh, kind of ensuring that the right context can be propagated through the system. Um, and then they sort of lead the way for everyone else on the team to be able to come in and add any little little custom details they want. So for instance, on our in-house stuff at Honeycomb, um, I've gone into code that other people have already started instrumenting and added you know, kind of particular details um, that are of interest to me. Um, so we do find that a lot of the time I think people kind of feel like instrumenting their code is going to be a much bigger deal than it really is. Um, and it just takes a little bit of elbow grease to get started with, and then the payoff is huge. Um, so like I said, you, know, you can actually capture the real things that are happening in your code, the real objects and sort of the state in the code, um, and put it in a honeycomb. It really works. Um, and so, yeah, it's certainly a team effort. Frequently there will be one um, hot shot that kind of leads the way. Um, but uh, then everyone can kind of chip in and add additional little things um, as they go along and move forward together. Yeah, my understanding of a best practice is don't feel like you have to retroactively go back and instrument, uh, you know, prior code that was created, but from here on out, start to do a better job of instrumenting new 
uh, features that you're releasing, right? Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's definitely something you see a lot is just a shift in mindset where people who, um, you know, they weren't really doing true observability before, and so when they start to kind of peel back the layers of the onion, you kind of start to realize the potential and, wow, I really can tag these things with really, really high dimensionality fields. I can have any arbitrary um, field that I want, whether it's a region or a client version or a big, long, awkward string. Honeycomb just handles it all and creates it very, very quickly. Um, you can also generate tracing data. So um, getting the actual answers that you're interested in um, becomes a lot easier. Okay, so um, in terms of the overall value, uh, Honeycomb has actually taken instrumentation quite seriously and created B-lines, what we call B-lines, which is auto-instrumentation for those useful events and traces. And um, we have B-lines for a variety of languages. So today's uh, demonstration that Nathan's going to go through is for Node.js. We also have Ruby, Python, Rails, and just released Java. So if any of you out there are um, interested in that, um, definitely get in touch with us. Um, and then we will see um, what Nathan just talked about, which is start out with those libraries, do some auto-instrumentation, get data into the Honeycomb tool, um, and then add to it, customize that as you go or grow. Um, and then you see the ability to slice and dice a request by a variety of dimensions. And you should be pretty quickly off the races and start doing some queries and debugging. So let's uh, let's shift gear, and Nathan's going to uh, start up Honeycomb and uh, do a demonstration of the product, and hopefully reflect those best practices that we just talked about. Yeah. So I'm just going to hop into a screen share here and bright talk. And so what I'll be showing today is a uh, demonstration of something that is actually uh, highly inspired by something that... hit screen share button? Yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Um, so it's taking a few seconds, folks. There we go. Yeah, so there's the Bright Talk, and uh, just going to pop over to this very exciting terminal window here. So what, what we're going to go through is an example of doing tracing using the Node.js beeline. And what's, what's fun is... A lot of people, they see our B-lines and they, they see that they can do automatic instrumentation of things like popular web frameworks like Express or uh, database layers and that kind of thing. Um, but what some people don't necessarily realize is you can actually create arbitrary traces for anything you want. Any program you have, you can actually generate traces. Um, so one customer that we had, they use this thing called Puppeteer, which is a node um, library or bindings for headless Chrome uh, that will actually let you do browsing and running of JavaScript uh, in Node um, with a headless browser. And you can actually do things like create PDFs or create screenshots of pages. Um, and so I have a little script that does that here. Um, and just to show you an example of kind of what it really does, um, like Let's say that I wanted to take a snapshot of the Google search results of news for Kentucky basketball. Um, running this program, um, it would uh, look something like this. Um, and uh, then uh, what you can see here is that uh, I actually generated this uh, screenshot.ping file that's a screenshot of that. Um, and um, then uh, here is the uh, screenshot. Um, uh, what it actually looks like. So um, when I ran the script, it started up a headless Chrome instance, uh, navigated to this uh, search for uh, Kentucky Wildcats um, on Google. And, um, you know, a lot of people might be doing stuff like this in, like, a background job uh, and that kind of thing. And um, this is actually a great example of something that can be a real differentiator for your business, like this kind of like extra functionality is, is uh, something a lot of people are moving towards and wanting to really be differentiating themselves on and kind of beating the competition by doing new and cooler stuff. But that presents more operational challenges, right? I mean, we're talking about something more complex than just running a simple web service. 
Um, so we're, we're doing like, you know, headless Chrome browsing um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so the possibility of this going wacky in production um, is higher than just a normal vanilla web app. And sometimes you launch this kind of stuff and you know it can do a lot for your, your business, but um, well, how the hell are we going to actually monitor and observe this thing? Um, and partially we think the answer is by instrumenting your code and getting this awesome high resolution visibility out of Honeycomb. Um, so, so coming back over to the, uh, the script here, um, let's take a look at what this code actually looks like. So um, first thing that we're doing is we're importing the, B, uh, importing the Beeline library and initializing it with our Honeycomb write key. Um, we're also requiring Puppeteer, which is the thing that actually does the headless Chrome browsing. Um, and the very first thing we do is we start a trace. Um, so in the Beeline, the main operations that you're working with um, are start trace and start span and uh, finishing those traces and those spans. So the very first thing that happens is we actually call beeline.startTrace, which, which tells the Beeline, okay, I'm going to actually start a new trace. Um, and uh, then uh, eventually we're going to be generating results that get sent to Honeycomb. Um, and we can use to actually observe our app. Uh, so um, just to maybe give you a quick, quick view of what the uh, finished, finished picture actually ends up looking like, um, like here is an example of what a full trace uh, will look like in the end as we go through the code. Um, I think it might help you to understand uh, from the end result we're looking for how this plays into what we're actually doing in the code. Um, so we have the root span here, which is you know about three and a half seconds. That's how long the whole script took to run. Um, and then we have broken out each little component of the script into child spans of this one parent span. Um, so the first thing that happened was we launched the browser. Um, then we went to the page, uh, and we can see clearly that this was where the most latency was incurred. Um, so this is, is exactly what tracing is all about, trying to figure out where your script is actually slow. Um, and then, you know, maybe we can actually improve that, or at the very least, we can sort of figure out, um, you know, what it actually looks like when we run this script, right? Because if I just run it and I don't have any instrumentation or insights into it, what do I know? It might take a really long time to screenshot the page. It might take a really long time to launch the headless Chrome instance. Um, you don't have any visibility, but now we have this really high resolution picture of exactly what it looks like to invoke the script. So. Um, this is what we were talking about, about being able to gain that really excellent high-definition snapshot of what's really going on in your code. Um, and so um, then we, you know, screenshotted the page. And so these are all, each row is a span. Um, and you can see over on the right here that each, each span has custom properties associated with it. Um, so coming back to the code, um, this launch browser span here um, is generated as a result of calling beeline.startspan. So, you know, I have this line of code right here that actually does the thing. Um, and before it, I called uh, start span. Um, and then after it, I called finish span. Um, so, so as the beeline works, um, it will basically time these things and then um, bundle up all the context and details into the span and send it along the honeycomb. And, and uh, this object that we're passing into the start span call here will be transformed into a honeycomb event. So you can see that um, you know, in this next span, uh, go to span, which ends up becoming this, we have an additional custom field. And you can have as many custom fields as you want. And honeycomb will handle incredibly wide events with hundreds of different fields. Um, to the point where it's more of a human bottleneck than a system bottleneck to be able to deal with that many fields and that much information and context. Um, we have the actual page that we're snapshotting as a um, argument that's passed to this call. Um, and so that way it will be actually added onto the generated event. Um, so so uh, as you can see, we have these beeline.startscan calls that end up becoming um, spans in the finalized trace. And um, when we run the scripts, in this case, we only have one custom thing. But usually what you'll be doing is 
augmenting your information with as much custom detail as, as you can or that you think would be actually useful. Um, and so I could, for instance, run this again on, say, the Honeycomb homepage. Um, maybe turn the debug mode on so we can see the actual details of the stands being generated. Um, and you can see the debug output of the V-Line is really useful for actually getting a picture at what spans are being generated, and even which trace ID is being used. Um, we can actually grab this trace ID and just pop it right into the Honeycomb Query Builder to look up a specific trace. Um, so I could filter where trace.trace ID equals this, um, and I can see my exact trace right here. Um, and if I go over to the Traces tab, um, this will let me jump right to the trace that I'm interested in. And we can see in the go to span um, that uh, here is this custom field of screenshot page. Right? So we have this custom detail. And while it's kind of cool to look at them in the, the tracing view, where this is really useful is things like um, maybe I'm running this on 200 different websites in production. Um, or, you know, I have a variety of sort of different scenarios uh, where um, something might might be happening or might be um, slow that I might want to look into, um, or maybe there's errors and that kind of thing. Um, we actually have features like Bubble Up that let you grab a collection of points. So, for instance, I can see in this heat map here that here's a slow point. Right? A heat map will show me where something was slow. Um, or where something was just high. It might be a regular old numeric field. Um, and in Bubble Up, we'll actually see a visualization of all this different context and detail that we can add on um, so that we might be able to spot you know, what's going on and what is actually the problem. Um, and so we can see that, uh, you know, for instance, this uh, particular slow point was associated really strongly with this specific trace. Uh, so I could filter down to that trace, and just like with the other one, I could pop right into the tracing queue. Um, and so uh, being able to query over all that custom detail is where Honeycomb really crushes it. Right? I could break down by something like screenshot page, um, and I'll get this little table summary of uh, all the different ones that I've run, and maybe I'll span the time window here. Um, so I can see you know, here was the one I made to Honeycomb, here was the one I made about Kentucky basketball, um, I could also, you know, uh, snapshots uh, like just google.com and run the script again. Um, and, and one of the things uh, Honeycomb is really pretty great about is um, really, really rapidly after you actually send these uh, data points to Honeycomb, they'll be available for querying, right? So. Um, you know, one of the things we hear from our customers that drives them crazy is if, if there's lag on being able to access their data that they're sending into their uh, um, observability or monitoring systems. And in Honeycomb, just because of the way the architecture is, the operational expertise and sort of excellent pedigree of the team, the data ingestion is like crazy rapid. Um, so uh, it's definitely worth calling out. The query engine is crazy fast. You know, we can scan. 10 billion data points in 10 seconds, so that kind of thing, and, and really just get you to those answers you need to know in order to deploy with more confidence and deploy more often, and to debug faster and smarter. To, to debug faster and smarter, but also to reclaim precious time. Right? right. I mean, that's one thing that I think is really hitting at the heart of, of what people find in Honeycomb that they're resonating with is. Their engineers are just spending so much less time fighting fires, pulling their hair out, looking through logs or something like that, and a lot more time doing the fun stuff and writing new code, shipping new features, and delivering value. So yeah. um, that's kind of a quick whirlwind tour, and uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Thanks very much, Nathan. That was great. Um, we don't have a ton of time to show you the product, but that's why we have future upcoming episodes in the series to uh, to do that, well, we'll get into a lot more detail on some of the features that Nathan touched on, so the, the rapid fast query engine, um, as well as the bubble up uh, spotting outliers. Um, so if you, I mean, I think that our goal today was to share with you how instrumentation would work and the importance of it, the value. It's 
it doesn't, it should not feel like climbing Kilimanjaro. It should be feeling like, you know, a little bit of a short hike, but it pays dividends for not just yourself as an engineer, but for your ops team and your SREs. Um, so take that time to instrument up front and leverage the power of B lines. Uh, we continue to build out those capabilities supporting other languages uh, depending on what our customer needs are. So to get started yourself, uh, we encourage you to start with Honeycomb Play. And if you're not ready to you know, utilize your own data, your own systems, this is our data. It's actually we developed this based on some incidents that we have here at Honeycomb. So it gives you a good view and access to a lot of the features. And when you're ready and the team has some bandwidth, then start a product trial. Um, you'll probably interact with Nathan and some of our colleagues uh, during that trial. And then encourage you to check back on this Bright Talk channel. Episode 2 will be March 20th, so coming up soon. It's all about how we're helping de-stress debugging um, and lots of new features to share with you in that uh, session. So um, thank you again for taking the time. And Nathan, that was excellent. Um, I will now take any questions that we may have. Um, please type them in your presenter in your at the bottom of your screen, I believe it was. So we'll just give folks a minute to um, type in any questions you have. So I have a question from the audience. Um, in terms of uh, instrumenting, can you also ingest logs? So uh, how do we do log ingestion data into Honeycomb? Sure. So um, if you already have logs that you'd like to get into Honeycomb, there are a variety of ways you can get them in. Um, we do have some binaries and built-in integrations where you can just um, start running it. And for instance, if it's uh, Amazon EOB logs, uh, we have a little binary that will just go and query the AWS API for information about that, download them, and then parse them out into structured events and sending um, send them to Honeycomb. Um, and so we, we have a variety of ways to get logs in, but usually it's just kind of trying to figure out a way to shim that into one of our existing integrations. For instance, we have a sort of Swiss Army chainsaw, if you will, of log parsing binary called Honeytail that tails along with log files and we'll, we'll parse them out with regex or, or uh, with a, you know, sometimes there's formats that we already understand out of the box like Nginx. Um, where you can send them along to Honeycomb. Now, that does come with a trade-off where you just don't really get as much flexibility out of those as you would out of um, something like um, this native code instrumentation that I showed off. Same thing with like traces. It's kind of hard to get that out of, um, you know, just static uh, logs. But we do offer that, and that can work really well as kind of a bridge to get people excited about Honeycomb and uh, sort of, um, make them realize what's possible and maybe why they want to uh, go for the native code instrumentation. So um, Honeytail is sort of the short answer. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, if you do want more information on in instrumentation, you can go to the product section of honeycomb.io. Um, we actually do weekly blogs, and mostly written by our engineering team. So um, there's some meaty content in there. I have a couple of more questions. Um, how difficult is it to add support for other programming languages? So uh, in addition to the five I mentioned, what, what's, the, what's the status there? And I know that we can um, do that fairly quickly depending on the customer need. Yeah, how difficult is it to add support for other programming languages? Well, um, that's all just a factor of, you know, whether that aligns with our sort of in-house expertise, um, you know, uh, how well you understand the Honeycomb API. I think basic support for sending things to Honeycomb is usually pretty rapid. 
So, you know, I mean, we have a really simple API. You just post JSON to an endpoint, and then it ends up getting ingested into a data set. So a sort of simple API usually ends up uh, being pretty, pretty approachable. Um, in the integrations where things get a little stickier is usually you want to do things like batching and, um, you know, running the sends in the background and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, that can take a little more time. And likewise, a beeline is sort of a full-fledged um, native uh, bindings for sending uh, traces and that kind of thing in. So that can take even more time. Um, but Adding support for other languages, it just depends. Um, and, and if you want to add support for something that you have, like if you love Erlang and you wanted to work on Erlang bindings, we'd be happy to have you in our, our uh, Slack channel to just kind of you know work with you to explain our APIs and idiosyncrasies and kind of help you get there. So, uh, is anyone actively working on a .NET beeline is a question. Um, there there are a couple people actually who are, are um, Third parties are outside of Honeycomb Inc. who are very interested in a .NET beeline and actually um, working on on similar things or sort of pseudo beeline things. We can't really properly call it a beeline unless it's in house. Um, we at Honeycomb Inc. want one really badly. Um, we are just kind of um, it's one part of our sort of um, constantly. Uh, changing roadmap of priorities. Well, it's not constantly changing, but... Um, Depending on our, the market need. Yeah, our, our um, I guess would say, what I'm saying is that we're a small startup with, you know, sort of limited means and abilities, and we, we, uh, we need to figure out where is the right time to invest resources in that, but we do want it really badly, and so do people in the community. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people who are working on that, yeah. Okay, so if you answer um, more uh, yeah. questions, we'll so, take uh, another two questions, and then if we don't answer them, we will definitely get back to you. Yeah, well, why should I use Honeycomb over AWS X-Ray? Well, because Honeycomb's the best, obviously. <laughs> um, no, I mean, to be honest, I don't know a, a whole ton about X-Ray, but what we usually say, see with AWS tools is they're very frequently just kind of good enough, and their main thing that, that is an appeal is they're built right into AWS. They don't have that deep, deep uh, product dedication and love that we have it with something like Honeycomb, where we are the experts in the space, and where we're 100% um, focused only on making Honeycomb the most killer experience possible. Um, so X-Ray, what I've, what I've found uh, in just kind of talking to people is it's a little limited in the ability to actually find what you want, um, and um, it's sort of just this good enough, moderate Amazon compromise. Um, and, and Honeycomb is the best, so you should use Honeycomb. Um, so then we uh, we had another question. How do I link events from different tiers, uh, from an ALB to a web server to a database into traces? Um, and so um, there's, a, there's kind of a variety of possible solutions. Um, and uh, it, I will say that it will be um, potentially difficult to get ALB logs in the same data set as your uh, your tracing data, but I would argue that's not necessarily a terrible thing because um, usually what I would recommend for people who want to grab a Honey ALB and send some of their ALB logs in is to send their Honey ALB data to a separate data set and just crank the sample rate up. So in Honey ALB, you can crank the sample rate up to 20 or 50 or 100, and you'll get so much more retention, and you'll get most of the benefits of having it there because we actually dynamically sample based on things like status code. Um, so for the weird oddball requests that get 503s, most of those will be included. Um, but uh, you know the boring 200 stuff will be sampled at a much higher rate. Uh, and, and Honeycomb will kind of do all the math and draw everything just the same. So um, a sample data set, I just kind of think of it like it's almost like a data set with some JPEG compression applied. Yes, technically it's lossy, but um, usually you can create quality that is still very high and it's good enough and it works great because um, just like with images, you wouldn't necessarily want to push a kajillion pixels over the wire to essentially get the same result um, when you can do it in two megabytes or something. So um, I highly recommend heavily sampling ALB stuff 
and then having your traces in another one and, and um, you know all your your database stuff frequently will hook into the libraries that generate that so you can get database tracing sort of out of the box with the B lines um, and even if we don't you know you could just write some custom spans like I showed you um, so uh, so is there uh, any more I think that's all the questions, and um, I appreciate that um, an engaged audience. That's cool. Uh, so that concludes. We are bang on 40 minutes. Uh, nice job, Nathan. Go Wildcats. And uh, check back the channel, and we will be in touch with you um, to send you further content to read all about it. And uh, have a nice day, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Bye-bye.